thanks everybody for joining us. Um, we are uh, Let's Kick Ass Palm Springs and we're welcoming today Mason Funk, who is the executive director and founder of Outwards, uh, outwardsarchive.org. I believe you can find them there. Um, and uh, if you hadn't heard of outwardarchives.org before, it's a great resource for um, learning about our history. Um, and uh, it has a number of LGBTQ, um, uh, I guess, best way to put it, maybe notables, uh, people who are really part of our history, um, who have uh, agreed to spend some time answering questions posed by Mason about their past. And um, and I'll just read a few things here that I also have on him. This is an award-winning nonprofit that documents the history of LGBTQ people all over the United States. He is also the author of the book, uh, Pride, LGBTQ Heroes Who Changed the World. Um, yes, there we go, the picture, the book of pride. Uh, which was published in 2019 by HarperCollins, and it's it looks as thick as those 288 pages it's purported to cover. So um, it serves a uh, one of the things that I, I saw on your our bio um, that I'm going to read just as a quote um, about um, uh, about your work generally is that it serves a critically important role in ensuring the history of the LGBTQ movement can never be erased, inspiring us to resist all forms of oppression with ferocity, community, and most importantly, pride. Um, those are great words because, you know, we're in this cancel culture kind of a, a movement and, um, and all these things about how we're, uh, you know, don't say gay and everything else that's going on uh, in this country. Um, that it's just, you know, really the challenge is ours to uh, to keep these memories and um, our history alive. Um, some other biographical stuff. Um, he was born in LA in 1958 and then graduated from Stanford. Left California for a while and, and came back eventually um, as an award-winning writer producer of nonfiction TV and documentary films. And he is also a long distance runner, choral singer, and chef. <laughs> and uh, right now we're seeing him from downtown LA. He lives in Silver Lake with his husband. And it's so great to see you here at Mason. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about yourself that I haven't said already. <laughs> Well, I first of all, thank you for the intro. I'm going to have to efface or erase. I'm not in favor of erasure, but the part about me being long distance runner, I had a great phase, you know, 10, 20 years ago, but uh, I'm slowing down. Uh, I still like to cook and I haven't been doing much singing lately because during the pandemic, chorals, choral groups and choruses went kersplat. They were some of the early super spreader events. So um, so that kind of took that out of my life and it hasn't made its way back in yet. Um, but it's really a pleasure to be here with you all today and to meet some of the members of, now I know how you say LCAPS. I wondered what your shorthand um, name for the group was. Um, <clears throat> as Jax explained, um, I came out of a long career in film and television. I always had loved, when you make any nonfiction program or documentary film, the first thing you start with is finding the people who can tell you the story. Mm -hmm. And I always loved those moments when I had found the person and we were alone in the room with a camera operator and a few lights. And it was just like, let's just talk, let's, let's just tell me your story and let me ask you questions. And out of that grew this vision of the LGBTQ plus community with this incredible generation of elders who uh, founded and created and built our community from scratch, overcoming numerous massive obstacles along the way and, um, and are alive today to share their stories, but won't be alive much longer. Uh, mortality sooner or later catches up with all of us. And uh, these people, the people that we really seek to interview are generally 
Some are in their 50s, but we practice what I call reverse ageism, meaning we always prioritize the people who are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, and even 90s, the people who essentially have the most uh, wisdom and experience to share and the least time left with us to share the stories. And I'm proud to say that in many, many cases, we have interviewed people who's some people we've interviewed for sure their stories have been fairly well documented. But many, many, many others, their stories, for whatever reason, are were in danger of being lost forever. That may be that because from within the LGBTQ community, they come from minority communities within the queer community. By the way, I use queer interchangeably with LGBTQ. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea. That's just what I what I do for shorthand. Um, so within the LGBTQ community, there's discrimination of all kinds, including racial discrimination discrimination against people with disabilities, um, people who who even within our small, you know, LGBTQ community tend to kind of fall by the wayside and whose stories are not lifted up and valued as often as, frankly, the cisgender white men among us. So we have gone out of our way consistently to make sure that we uplift those stories as well to create what I call a kind of a fully rounded 360 degree portrait of our community. And the work is ongoing. We published that book uh, in 2019 as part of the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, but, but we were not finished. In some ways I call the book a beautiful pamphlet for the ongoing work of recording, preserving and sharing the stories of LGBTQ plus elders. And as Jack's referenced, our work has never been more important than now. Mm -hmm. Who would have imagined when we launched seven years ago that we were gonna face this really intense tidal wave of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation going through state houses across the country. Literally today, Florida raised the don't say gay age all the way to high school seniors, meaning that effectively throughout the Florida public school system, a teacher cannot mention gender orientation, gender identity or sexual orientation without risking losing his, her or their job. So we've never seen anything like this. And I never would have imagined that we would, but here we are. And we think of ourselves more and more as a frontline organization. We're not just a feel good organization. We're not here just to celebrate our history. We are here to provide stories and inspiration for particularly young trans and gender non-conforming youth mm -hmm. and their families who are who are really facing the worst mm -hmm. of this particular firing squad of anti-LGBTQ bills um, across the country. So those are my introductory comments. Um, it's, it's heavy going. It's it's serious work. We try to do it with a, you know, with a smile, mm -hmm. but of course with a great degree of commitment. And I'm very, very proud of our small but mighty team. Um, and we are a nonprofit, you know, here in the state of California, we live off the donations of our of, of people, individual donations, as well as foundation grants. So, of course, I'm going to mention along the way that if you're inspired to donate, I'll be happy to put that that uh, that URL in the chat window. Great, great. Let me just take a breath, hand it back to you, Jax, and or anybody who has any questions. And then I do have a couple of short videos that I'd like to share with you just to give you a little taste of the work we do. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for uh, filling in some of the gaps in my in my introduction here. Um, it, you know, it's amazing because I was like looking at the timeline too about uh, between 2016 when you founded Outworks and then 2019 when you actually published the book. So I would imagine that a lot of the work that you had already done in terms of videography uh, ended up being part of the book. So was there was there things that were outside of the project, uh, uh, the documentary, you know, the documentary side of things that were put into the book that um, that you might not find on the archives page? In reality, it's more the opposite. The mm -hmm. book is a representation of the full scope of everything we've collected. Mm -hmm. So the book consists of about 75 of our interviewees and we took their transcripts and we shortened them into little mini chapters. And I, I sometimes joke that the book is a great book to have like sitting next to your toilet because the little sections are just perfect for like a, you know, a two or three minute moment of relaxation. You can take in somebody's story. 
But what we're proud of, or one of the things I'm proud of is that on our website, which is theoutwordsarchive.org, and that's the out words, like spoken words, archive.org, we publish full length interviews, the full video and the full transcript. So you can get in there and there's all kinds of search capabilities. So you can go in there and you can search around, you know, imagine you were born in Iowa and you're like, is anybody in this archive from Iowa? Well, you can search for Iowa. Or if you, um, uh, what's another example? If you are a scientist, a biologist, and you're curious, are there any scientists in here? You can do quite elaborate searches to try to zero in on the stories that mean the most to you, or you can just go in there and browse. So I really think of it as like a digital library mm -hmm. and it's completely free. It's completely free. No one has to pay a membership fee or a subscription. You can just walk in and wander around and spend as much time as you like. So you've spent a lot of time uh, on in the West Coast, obviously, and then uh, some a few other places. Um, I guess in this pro in the process of putting this stuff together, you've probably gotten to know a lot about the rest of the country as well. You yeah. know, I'm a transplant from New York, uh, who's been in Los Angeles now for nearly 25 or the West Coast for nearly 25 years. And then, um, and spent a number, a lot of time traveling uh, on the road between uh, here and the East Coast. Um, and that was kind of my education of the rest of the country. Um, but it, it's not like the lived experience of people who were there um, during some of the most momentous, you know, chapters of, you know, what we would consider LGBT history. And one of the things that I've even noticed, you know, because being, you know, raised in New York, uh, basically, that, you know, we get so stonewall um, focused that, you know, we don't know what the rest of uh, the, the country was going through and, and find out that there was, you know, you're living in Silver Lake, right? So there's this bar called Black Cat there that had a, a big protest, not unlike the Stonewall, uh, but, you know, probably a lot less riotous, um, but it happened before Stonewall. So, you know, it's all part of our history. So um, how, how has that informed you in getting to know the rest of the country, I guess, as yeah. uh, you know, in the context of LGBT history? It's been so gratifying. I mean, I could talk for hours about just the personal satisfaction I've gained from meeting people in different parts of the country. The example that comes to mind is, uh, I'm looking this, if I look this way, it's because I have a map on my wall. Here, let me show you just real quick. This is a map of the US. And if you can, if you can see, there are blue dots. And those blue dots represent everywhere where we've recorded an interview. Um, and down there is Texas. And mm -hmm. I took a big trip to Texas prior to the pandemic, mm -hmm. spent um, eight days recording 13 interviews. And one of my favorites was with a guy named Ray Hill, who was a troublemaker from day one, went to jail uh, for petty larceny or something stupid like that. But he he just refused to be quiet. And, and, and you know, he was a radio host. He formed an organization. He literally formed a radio program for, uh, for incarcerated people and their families to be able to talk to each other. Huge success, completely out of the realm of his work as a gay activist. Mm -hmm. um, but he told the story about how way back in the late 70s, now we're about 10 years post Stonewall, Anita Bryant was mounting her Save Our Children campaign nationwide. And she came to Houston to, I think, sing the national anthem at what I believe was the like the Republican National Convention or some big GOP, GOP convention. And this was a lightning rod. And Ray Hill he went to the sheriff and he asked for a permit for a parade. And the sheriff said, oh, Houston's not a, organ not a demonstrating town. And Ray got out there and he had a huge protest that basically flooded the convention center. They couldn't get inside, but they made it clear that Anita Hill was not welcome there. And that was effectively the birth of the Houston L gay, gay and lesbian rights community that particular event, which happened in, I think, eight, 78 or 79. Mm. So, And she had that effect of talk about the world of unintended consequences. She had that effect in Atlanta, Houston, New Orleans, pretty much anywhere in the South that she went. She helped trigger the birth 
of the LGBTQ plus communities in those cities. Wow. So meeting Ray, who has since passed on, may his soul rest in peace, uh, was an incredible honor and just lit our history up so vividly because he was a guy who he was just like, literally, I just hit press play on him and he just talked for two hours solid. I couldn't get a question in edgewise, wow. but the stories were so incredible. Hmm. Yeah, has anybody really surprised you? I mean, I imagine you do a little bit of research in, in advance because you want to make sure that you're not wasting your time with anybody. But, you know, the thing is, um, there might be some times where somebody shows up with a story you you hadn't researched. So oh, 100%. What do, you, what do you do with that? Well, you 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 try to seize the moment and I have a great example of that. So last summer, we've been, um, you know, there's all this outreach happening to different communities within our community. For example, the indigenous, indigenous Q, queer people or indigenous LGBTQ people, they frequently refer to them, themselves, not always, as two-spirit. Mm -hmm. That's a term they use. And I went to South Dakota last summer to interview uh, a small group of two-spirit um, activists in Southwest South Dakota around Rapid City and near the Pine Ridge Reservation. Mm -hmm. And I, I roll up on the porch of a person I'm going to interview. Her name is Olivia DeSursa. And I don't know, we have steps we try to go through with our interviewees, but they sometimes don't follow the steps. And sometimes I literally show up knowing next to nothing, except somebody said, go talk to Olivia. Wow. But while I was sitting there on her porch, my director of operations, who was doing research madly trying to find out, he discovered that her brother had been an Indian rights activist back during this, this standoff, a famous standoff that occurred on the Pine Ridge Reservation when there was a split within the tribe and a lot of local activists seized control of the, of the um, headquarters, the tribal headquarters. This became national news and eventually resulted in several of the activists being killed mm. uh, in a kind of an inter-tribal dispute. And her brother was one of those activists mm. who, got, who ended up dying. The result was we were able to capture a piece of critically important American social history that really had nothing to do with Olivia. She was like a four-year-old or a six-year-old child when this happened, but she had vivid memories of the standoff. And I'm so grateful that we are able to capture essential information about America all the way back to, de to, this, to segregation, for example, mm -hmm. eras that seem like they're in our rear view mirror, but they're not. And they're still alive today in our country. We're still grappling with issues of race. And we're able to intersect with these people who have been eyewitnesses, yeah. uh, Vietnam War veterans, you know, Korean War veterans, mm -hmm. people who have been at the forefront of so many different important chapters of American history. And we're able to capture those stories while capturing the stories of people's LGBTQ identities. Right. So I really feel like we're bringing a lot to the table, not just for our community, but for American social history. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, and the thing to me, too, that that, that probably uh, is, you know, these stories do repeat themselves over time. I mean, the, 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 the conflicts, the, you know, the bad actors, they just have different names, they just have different places. Um, but they bring out the same emotions, I think, that we can all relate to. And um, one of the things that uh, is important for our group, because we're a group of basically a long term survivors and um, and we're always, you know, we wonder whether or not our story is going to be told at some point, you know, and um, and and. One of the reasons why we call our group uh, AIDS Survivor Syndrome, ASS, is because there was a, this traumatic event that we all went through back in, you know, in the, the what we call the plague years. And, um, and you know, so it's kind of like a, a post-traumatic syndrome where we're the ones who get to tell the story of the people we lost. Um, a generation of, of young men, basically, who just never filled, fulfilled their true potential. And, and I know I've heard some of your stories and, and some of the people talk about those same issues, even if they're not long-term survivors themselves and talk about the impact of you know, what it was like to have a friend who was very young and very promising and then gone way too soon. So um, how, how I, I, you, it must be 
you, I guess if you, you if you're talking to mostly people who are over sixty, let's say, yeah, there must not be a single person who can't mention get away without mentioning HIV, right? Hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, really, the HIV AIDS epidemic is I would call it the the defining the defining incident or um, crisis of our of our story. I don't. I really don't think. None of us can imagine, you know, what would our lives be like today if HIV AIDS had never occurred. But what we do know is that it had a profound impact on every one of us individually, as well as on the direction of our community. <clears throat> it shaped us forever. It taught us survival skills. It taught us organizing skills. Um, it, it, it galvanized us. Uh, it, it had the, it, it had the effect of in many ways, bringing us into public awareness at first in profoundly negative ways, mm. but pretty soon people were realizing, hey, wait a minute, I have a neighbor, I have a friend uh, who is gay, and they might not have ever known that. It was, a, it, was, it was, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. In fact, you know a lot more than I do about the, the effects, the long-term effects of HIV AIDS on our community, as well as, of course, on each of us as individuals, whether you're survivors or not. We have had the opportunity, and I, the, the the videos that I'd like to share with you, one is with a, a person you probably have met, some of you at least, Doc Duhan, right there in Palm Springs, who was one of our earliest interviewees in the summer of 2016, and then a guy named Michael Hickerson from New Orleans, um, and uh, they specifically talk about their work with HIV AIDS. I don't think Michael talks specifically, but he's also a long-term survivor. Um, and Doc certainly talks about the effect of HIV AIDS on his life as a kind of a turning point. Um, we had a grant from Gilead to, to interview 10 uh, HIV AIDS activists in the South specifically mm -hmm. um, to make sure that those stories, which tend to get lost and overlooked, were you know to bring those stories to the light and make sure they're preserved forever. Mm -hmm. So I can't say enough about the importance of preserving that history and the honor we have of participating in the preservation of that history uh, for the world to never forget. Okay. Um, you think this might be a good time to roll at least one of them? Sure. Excuse me. Let me, let me share my screen. I have, I have uh, both Doc and Michael uh, queued up. Um, and I'm going to, let's see, optimize for video. And then let me start with... Um, with Doc, and it's pretty. It's it's under two minutes. Um, but you'll if you know Doc, you'll recognize him. If you don't, you'll get to know him a little bit, and then we'll come back together. Uh, let's see. Let me make this. I want to move. I've learned a few tricks along the way. Okay, I think we should be good to go. It looks good to me. Oh wait, but I want to make sure I'm on the right. This is the one that I want. Okay, here we go. My doctor told me in May of 2001 that he recommended that I leave work because of the way my body was reacting to the virus and even with the meds, the chronic fatigue that I was having and the other issues I was having physically, that I was under way too much stress for me to stay healthy on the long term. And I ignored him. I had never felt more validated in my career in my life. I was doing things that were, I felt were really important. And I loved what I did. I loved it. Building energy efficient schools and establishing criterion for California's energy policy and so many other good things we were doing. And it was really wonderful work. So I ended up in a situation where I worked myself into the ground again. Towards the end there, I can remember sitting at my desk and literally being in tears because I could no longer keep up with the demand. And I didn't know what to do. And I called my sponsor, and I still have a sponsor in program. She's been my sponsor for 20 some years. Yeah, and I started whining to her about my life was my job and I made a difference in the world. And she said, honey, I have something to tell you. She's not gonna be easy to hear. Said, you used to be important, and now you're not, get over it. <laughs> I went out and got the tattoos on my hands that day. I'd always been tattooed. I've been tattooed, heavily tattooed since I was a young man all over my body. But I didn't have any tattoos that showed when I worked in the corporate world. And that day I went out and got the tattoos on my hands. And I haven't looked back.
Yeah, that's great. Did you all see that okay? And was that okay? Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's a little slice of, you know, a two hour interview. And we, of course, take enormous joy and delight in finding those moments, you know, the story where he holds up his hands and we see his hands and, um, and the symbol symbolism of having tattoos on his hands. So anyway. Um, yeah, I haven't seen a picture of uh, Doc that young. So that was kind of amazing for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's a great, a great member of our community. We see him a lot. So yeah. Um, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. So, um, and in the, you know, and in the context of, you know, talking to somebody about, um, you know, their, their importance, that's really kind of, you know, how important he is to this project is, is uh, pretty evident as well. So it's funny that he thinks that he was, you know, getting over himself in a way, but, you know, his words will be really part of a legacy um, that we will all appreciate for a long time. So um, what, it, tell, uh, how are you doing this archival thing? I mean, is it, is there some magic to it? I mean, is there something about, you know, like national archives and how we have to use a Dewey decimal system on these things? And, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, is this going to be, how is, how are researchers going to be able to access this other than just going to the website and, you know, or is that really, is a website equipped for that kind of research? It really is. I mean, we we field requests from researchers who want specific information, maybe in a different format. But the idea behind the website is that that can be useful to both serious academic scholars as well as casual visitors. Uh, hopefully, anybody who is looking for something in this realm of LGBTQ plus history can find it there. Um, eventually, there are some questions that will have to be answered about where will all this data, all these, all this data live in a permanent way. Right now, everything's stored on hard drives, mm -hmm. and hard drives are inherently unstable. We have three matching sets of hard drives stored in different locations, and we back everything up like you know, like very, very, very carefully and diligently. That's the that's the archiving professional best practices piece. That we have to that we're learning in and growing into but eventually there will probably be a permanent home where the materials will all be accessible but it'll probably be like a university that has a built-in staff making sure that everything is checked and reached when you have hard drives like i say they're designed to fail so you have to copy everything over to new hard drives we probably at a certain point have to literally print out the transcripts of every single one of our interviews, because while hard drives fail, paper, amazingly enough, doesn't, as long as it's acid-free and it's stored in acid-free containers. So the reality is we're going to go back to the, you know, the, the dark ages, so to speak, and one of the ways we'll make sure this history is preserved is just by having hard copies yeah. that are distributed to various locations. Right, right. And it's so important because I think uh, you know, my uh, husband, uh, Clayton Coppice, is a professor emeritus of history. Huh. And he's currently working on a history of, of HIV AIDS in America. And he's actually gone to a number of universities to actually get wow. these oral histories that people have done. Um, and they're published in, you know, in great tomes of, you know, uh, in various places, very learned places. So it's it's wow. it's a great resource. And, and some of these things have been used over and over again in research materials and books and articles. So it's so important to have that accessible to academics. I'm, that's really cool that your husband's a, an actual historian and professor of history. I take my hat off to my mom, who was a, kind of an amateur historian, but I think she instilled that in me and my dad, who was a journalist. And this apple did not fall far from the tree because I, I really feel like I combined the, that journalistic impulse and that just love of history. Um, and I'm so, I'm so glad your husband is, that that's his life's work. Yeah, yeah. Well, among some other projects. Yeah. But, um, uh, I do want to see the other video you have for us and, I, and then we'll uh, open it up for some questions. Awesome. Let me do that. Uh, give me one second and see if I can choose uh, to share. When I was in 12th grade, I worked at the Municipal Auditorium. It's right outside the French Quarter in the Treme area, but it was a venue where all the concerts, all the Mardi Gras balls and 
all of this kind of society stuff was hell. So we worked these uh, concession stands when they had events going on there. There was one event that did it for me. I saw these men having this, what is now Mardi Gras ball, but I didn't, knew that, I didn't know they were men. They were these women in beautiful dresses and feathers and having this thing where they promenaded around the floor and they bowed and was just so elegant. And I had never seen anything like that in my life. I was just fascinated. It was the crew of Apollo. I heard the names and I thought, ooh, I want to do that. The crews are a spoof on straight society. The straight society have these elaborate Mardi Gras balls where these young debutantes become queens. Well, the gay community took it a step further and made it a parody, a spoof on that. Eventually, I joined an organization called the Crew of Amun Ra. They had never had a, a black in their organization. And like a third of the organization quit. Eventually, I was honored to be ball captain of the crew of Amun Ra. And I took the crew on a, um, into outer space. And I came from the ceiling of the ball, you know, this space costume with this Patti LaBelle hair and stuff like that, you know, singing Star Love, you know, come with me tonight all across the universe. I'll be 62 in, in September, you know, and it's taken a long time for me to get to be who I am today. I now know I can walk into a room and not have to hide, you know, my sexuality or anything, not have to hide my blackness. I can be me. Wow, thanks for sharing that one. You know, it's amazing. I, uh, I have only been to New Orleans once, but I did make it to a Mardi Gras museum. And when I saw this display about the history of, of gay men and the balls, uh, it was very enlightening. I was like drawn to it and like saying, oh, there should be a whole museum just for this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, you. I loved, you know, speaking of New Orleans, those cities I was ticking off, Houston, New Orleans, Atlanta, you know, mm -hmm. we, I haven't been physically to Atlanta, but I've been to New Orleans and it was just such a joy meeting Michael. He's, you know, his spirit is so bright. He says he's going to be 62. That was about five years ago. So now he's like 66, 67 years old. Um, <clears throat> he started, in, he got a, after working in bars, he has incredible stories about, he couldn't gain admission to the bars as a black guy. Mm. Unless he got a job. And that was one of his ways that he got integrated into New Orleans gay life was just working at bars and having a great personality and, of course, a great smile. But then eventually he went back to school, got his degree in social work, and then found an, an aid service organization uh, to serve the community. And just a terrific guy. And it was just, I just remember to this day, the his warmth and his, his smile and his stories. Wow. Um, so... You must be like turning people down for, you know, for interviews. I mean, what is your, is, is it like this huge line of people that you've got? <laughs> like, you know, I can't imagine, you know, I, there's just so many lists of, you know, Out Magazine keeps lists of prominent gay people, all these magazines, publications, you could probably just pick and choose who you might well, want to interview and it's you know maybe not everybody wants to speak to you at this point but you know it must be a challenge to go through a list that probably is pretty long and then also given the fact that not all of us are going to 
last that long either. You have to start prioritizing who's who looks healthy and who doesn't. Absolutely. We it helps that we focus on elders. So a huge portion of our communities, we basically say, wait your turn. Um and um we do have honest conversations with people sometimes. If there's somebody we want to interview, but we can't get around to them for say three to six months, I'll just simply ask, you know, are you is your health okay? Because you just got to have those conversations. If someone says, and we really just recently in Palm Springs, there was a, a gentleman who another person had recommended as an interview. And we started the process in motion. This guy had been living with cancer. And lo and behold, he passed away before we could interview him. Right. Our eyes almost. So we we have a long list. We devote, we are trying to reverse decades and centuries of erasure and marginalization of people uh, within the queer community, including people of color and people with disabilities and others. So we devote 60% of our interview, we, we do about 50 to 60 interviews per year, and 60% of those are devoted to, uh, to people of color. From communities of color, of which there is an, a vast number of different communities, each with its own history. Um, you can't just say the Hispanic community. You can't just say the Black community or the Asian American community. Each community has many, many sub-communities. So we have just made that a priority. And so that helps because when it comes to you know, people who identify as white, we oftentimes have to be even more selective and say, is this person someone who we want to interview now because because we want to devote a, a, a large proportion of our energy to these underrepresented communities and projects like ours. Yeah, I think the challenge too, at least here in Palm Springs, is that so many of us are transplants. So you might just think, oh, well, we've already got a few Palm Springs people, but you know, even Doc, who's really a San Francisco to Palm Springs yeah. transplant, you know, you might just, you know, you'd say, well, maybe there's some people that you could find to represent some of those other cities yeah. that you've been missing on, but they're here, here, they're here, already yeah. here in Palm Springs. So, I mean, we could set up a camera studio in Palm Springs. We could shoot interviews for a month and we wouldn't even scratch the surface because there are so many people there who have come to Palm Springs because of its beauty and it's, you know, it's healthy air, but who bring their incredible stories from elsewhere in the country. So, I mean, Palm Springs is a gold mine for us. Mm. Um, and, and, we haven't really spent all that much time proportionally in Palm Springs, but when I go to when I go to um, Oscars on like a Sunday afternoon, I just look around and I'm like, or I mean, if I just go to any old place, you know, Sherman's or whatever the case might be, I look around and I'm like, oh my gosh, I should just have a camera set up right here. Of course, we do things in a more formal way than that, but there's an incredible amount of stories to be captured right in Palm Springs. Yeah, but I, you know, I, I've been here now for nearly a decade and, you know, sometimes people just surprise me out of the blue with, you know, stuff about where they've been or things that they've experienced or like, you know, you know, who knows that somebody's like sitting on a story like, you know, well, I was outside of St. Patrick's Cathedral when somebody threw blood at, you know, at uh, the Cardinal, exactly. you know, it's like, you know, how was I supposed to know that? You yeah. Know, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just an amazing opportunity. If there are people here who are listening to you now who want to, uh, to say whether or not their story or somebody else's story, because you were talking about somebody who, you know, who recommended somebody to you, um, you know, we might know of somebody who's like, oh, one of those folks. I, I see it's going into the, the chat, your email address, mfunk at the outwards archive.org. So send an email directly to you. That's the best way to get the ball rolling. And I'm very, very curious. And of course, I'd like to set aside some time for questions. I have to, I have a hard out at 630, but we have a few minutes for questions. But all you, if you want to just jot down the email address, either one will work. Either one will get to me. The info at will get to our team. The mfunk gets directly to me. Um, I'm happy to hear from you and answer your questions. Uh, but I'm also happy to answer any questions you have right now. Okay, so I don't have any questions in the chat right now. So if somebody wants to unmute themselves, I think Andrew just did. Did you want to? Do you have a question, Andrew? Yeah, I wanted. To, um, yeah, you you mentioned the publicist. Was that Howard Bragman? If uh, can you name names or not? 
Uh, I don't remember mentioning a publicist, but I did know. Just, just a few minutes ago, you said you tried to get an interview with it at a publicist and then he died. And Oh, this was a different person, but Howard was someone who both my, myself and my husband knew. Okay. And we're very sad to hear of his passing. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm only aware of Howard Bregman um, because uh, Robert Black does uh, podcasts out and videos now out here. And he, he calls the series Sexual Heroes, but he did he did an hour and a half interview with Howard Bragman, oh. whom I really didn't know his story, um, and it is posted on YouTube. But it was it was just an extraordinary um, interview because it covered so much of his life and what he accomplished, oh. and um, and I and I watched it uh, because I've been curious of the things that Robert Black has been doing, and and then. And then, like a week or with uh, two weeks, within two weeks after I watched it, the obituary in the Times hit, and I was just yeah. floored that uh, that he did that, that he had that, and uh, he did another person recently, and I'm going to have to look up his name again. Uh, it was a totally different uh, work line, but I can't remember. Um, but again, it was you know fascinating. And, you know, although, so, I mean, so he's doing it. Some of his stuff is more sexually, erotically oriented with people, but these were, you know, really pure history stuff. And so it, it was, it's really excellent work that he's doing within his own line of stuff. Um, I know uh, there are people back East who are doing uh, oral histories. And uh, I was trying to find out I can't remember if it's uh, Eric Sawyer or Alan Roscoff or whom uh, I'm sure you must be connected with them. Uh, but I, I I was trying to find the site and I look, I came up on oral history website and it has a lot of different things. And I, I saw it has, it has your material on there with a lot of others. Hmm. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Let me see what that, what this site was. Uh, oh, this is outward. Sorry, I don't. Know. Well, I know we, I, I, Andrew. Oh. You mind if we like to see if somebody else has a question while you're looking for that? Yeah, no, go ahead. I'm. That's fine. Great, thanks. If you have a question, please unmute yourself. If you need some help, just put it in the chat. While we're waiting for a question, I have another question for you too, Mason. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I know we don't have a whole lot of history of people, gay people, openly serving in our government, um, especially in federal government. And, you know, if there were a fly on the wall for some of these things that have happened during our history, um, you know, like being in, in the Reagan administration during HIV AIDS, are those stories that you're you're hearing from folks? I don't know if you are, because uh, I'm sure, you know, my experience has been that there are some people who are late bloomers, so to speak. They come out later in life, so they might have had that career working in the White House, not coming out, but then, you know, came to Jesus, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a great question, Jax, and I, we don't, I don't, I'm, nobody's coming to mind who had that particular experience of being closeted and working in these, like say a Republican administration coming out later in life. I'm fascinated. And all I can say right now is if any of you all have stories like that or hear stories of like that, of people who are still around and able to share their stories, we would be, we'd be all about those stories. Yeah. There was a woman who passed away, an incredible activist named Jean O'Leary, and, her, and she was partnered with a woman named Midge Costanza, I think. Mm -hmm. And they were in the Carter administration. They, they were probably, I think it was Midge who worked in the Carter administration and organized probably the first ever meeting of LGBTQ or lesbian and gay people in the White House. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, both those individuals have passed away. And a friend of mine has hours of interviews with Jean O'Leary and Midge Costanza. And she said that she wants to give us the tapes so they can find a home. But boy, getting her to cough up those tapes has been like, are you kidding me? How many times do I have to ask you? And every time I ask, he's like, I gotta go to my storage unit. I'm like, Gretchen, what's it gonna take for you to get to your, to your, your storage unit and cough up those tapes? Something's getting in the way. But anyway, that's a whole separate story. 
Oh my God. Anybody yeah. else? I see Christopher, you're unmuted. Yeah, go, go Christopher. Oh, it's just interesting hearing Gina O'Leary because um, she was part of the crew that did start the uh, National Out Day. And yeah. um, at one time I was married and my former wife worked for her. So it was an um, interesting time in Los Angeles and West Hollywood. They were just becoming a city then. Yeah. Um, I guess some of my questions might be like, what's one method of access? I was looking at the website, but um, I was trying not to get too distracted or down that rabbit hole, seeing how to access the stories. I see that one of the pull downs has <clears throat> LGBTQ identities and ally bisexual. I see that you um, you kind of um, put the groups in categories by um, identity there. And um, are there other ways to access the story? I heard and in the beginning you were saying putting in keywords. Yeah, you can use that search window um, at the very tip top and you can literally type in, it's kind of like doing a Google search. In reality, you type in a word. I'm pretty sure that you can type in a phrase in quotation marks and it'll search for that exact phrase. Although I should probably check that before I say that uh, too frequently. But that search window, and then you can, there's a same thing that says advanced search. And um, honestly, I would love it if you would poke around and do some searches and you could e email me and tell me what your experience was like. Cause we're always trying to make sure that it really works for people in the way that is most useful to them. But that's another way that you can poke around is you can do targeted searches or you can look at those collections, whether it's by race or by identity or other types of collections. There's also a map um, further down on the homepage where you can zoom in and you can click on a little circle and it'll take you to the people that we've interviewed. So you can do kind of like a, instead of doing a, you can do like a kind of a form of a geographical search in that way. Oh, uh -huh. Those are a few of the ways, but again, I'm very interested in your experience, your user experience, mm -hmm. positive, negative, or otherwise. We, we really thrive on feedback so we can know what we need to fix. Thank you, Christopher. Andrew, did you want to come back to your what your comment was? A couple more things. Well, I, I do see that you uh, have interviewed David Mixner, who was certainly uh, an important Politico uh, involvement. He was, even though he wasn't in the Reagan administration, I only recently found out from PBS show on American Experience, The Method of the Mad Men, that he was in the Nixon administration. Wow. And he was closeted then, but uh, he was, that that's a very good episode about Nixon's uh, crazy attempt of threatening uh, North Vietnam with nuclear uh, in, in attack uh, to help try to end the Vietnam War. But uh, Mixner is, is interviewed in that also uh, wow. during the course of that, um, saying he was, he was concerned about coming out at the time. Yeah. Um, but um, the other person that Robert Black interviewed that I saw recently is Richard Hames, who was um, started, I, I don't know if he was the first person, he was very involved with the LGBTQ um, Community Center in New York, and also with the Antiviolence Project in New York. And uh, it's another hour and a half interview. And um, uh, he also seem, uh, uh, lives out here now, I gather. and. Um, Robert Black's, uh, these interviews are behind a Google wall that you have to log into as so-called adult, but th they are not adult at all. <laughs> it's just that that's what his, uh, his whole, since some of his are adult talk, but there's nothing in, in the videos that's adult. Maybe in Florida it's adult. Perhaps, yes. <laughs> so anyway, I, I do recommend uh, these are really valuable pieces right. that he's done. One of the things that I try to, you know, we, we talk so much about activism. We talk about a lot of things. And sometimes it's easy to lose sight of the fact that we are a sexual community. And I love it when people just tell us like their stories of the first time. One of my favorite stories is a woman in Atlanta, Pat Hussein, who talks about, you know, gathering the nerve to go to her first lesbian bar 
and and meeting someone and she at the time she was driving like a Ford Econoline van and she talks about going out to the parking lot with this woman and getting in the back of her van you know and making the van you know what's the expression if the if the something don't come knocking if the if the van ain't rocking or something the van ain't <laughs> Her telling of that story just lights me up every time because it's just like, yeah, this is it. This is the sex. We don't want to lose sight of the fact that, you know, that that sex is at the core of our identities. And that's why a lot of us are part of this community because of our sexual orientation. We've had other people share stories and they just, it's so refreshing to not only be in our heads, but in our bodies and hearing these stories. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I know you have a hard deadline here or a hard cutoff time. So I just wanted to say thank you very much from uh, all of us here at Let's Kick Ass Palm Springs. And uh, if you want to learn more about Mason Funk and the outwardarchives.org, uh, you go to the outwardarchives.org. Um, and he also told us that his email address is mfunk, F U N K, at the outwardsarchive.org. And um, thank you so much. It was very enlightening to hear what you have to say, and we wish you well in your endeavors. And who knows, maybe you'll see one of our other fellow Palm Springs people pop up in one of your your archival things. So we just want to say well, that. and please don't be shy about about nominating yourself to be interviewed. Honestly, I would, I would, I would, I want to say that very loud and clear. Please don't be shy. If you feel like you've got an important story to share, we might not get to you today, tomorrow, or next week, but we definitely want to know your story. We have a questionnaire you can fill out that'll help us to get to know, get acquainted with you a little bit. And I, I regard all of you as people who almost without a doubt are sitting on amazing experiences that maybe no one has ever shared with us. So like I say, my last three words, my last four words are, please don't be shy. Thank you. And thank thank you. you so much for having me. Thank you. All righty. Take good care. See you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye.